This is Twit. We haven't been back to the moon with humans for a long time, as we all know, Mm -hmm. 50 years or so. And we haven't done a lot of robotic work up there, mostly orbital. And suddenly Mm -hmm. it seems like there's a lot happening. So I think if you're a lay person and you just are, you know, sort of reading USA Today tidbits, (laughs) you may be wondering, gosh, why all this sudden interest in the moon? I keep hearing about this new space race, China and Russia and the U.S. and Japan and India are all trying to get probes there after this long period of quiescence. What uh, what cued us up for this moment? I think. I mean, one is looking over the fence at the neighbors. Okay, well, they're they're sending probes to the moon. We're sending probes to the moon, and it becomes, you know, a bit of a race. Um, but also, you know, it's a it's a very tangible, reachable goal for a space agency. You know, it's I won't say easier to send a probe to the moon than it is to Mars, but you can get to the moon in three days as opposed to several months to Mars. And so, for for growing space agencies, it becomes a good first destination, right? Let's send a probe to the moon, prove that we can do this, and then maybe go deeper into space. Second is, I mean, th- there's a lot that can be done at the moon with a handful of simple sensors, cameras, radiation detectors, compositional instruments. And lastly, it's just like real estate, location, <laughs> location, location. And with the moon, we have, particularly at the lunar poles, we've got potential resources. We have uh areas that are extremely cold we have areas that get extended illumination so there are places on the moon that become immediately i don't know centers of gravity and not literal (laughs) centers of gravity but centers of of interest hey we want to understand what's happening here um in these areas at the moon particularly at the south pole and and i think that's one of the reasons why you find ourselves having multiple missions to the moon going up you know, rapid fire, and it becomes a really exciting time. I, I as an lunar enthusiast, have an d- incredibly difficult time keeping track of all of the missions that are <laughs> about to launch on their way, what's there. And so, uh, you know, never in my wildest dreams did I think that we'd be in this position where I just can't keep it all straight. <laughs> and yet here we are. And that's why we asked you to come, because <laughs> while this is all happening, you know, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, one of your two missions has been there for 14 years or so if i've got my math Mm -hmm. right since 2009 and Mm -hmm. the other mission artemis 3 is going to be there with people doing more science in just just a few years so you're kind of bookending like uh this this entire period and and you know you you just mentioned like location location with resources and whatnot and i know that artemis 3 is going to try to find what the story is our lro Mm -hmm. has kind of seen lots of clues about the hint, particularly you mentioned resources. And of course everyone thinks about water and water yeah. ice uh, uh, there. And I guess the, the big question is, I mean, you know, wh- what have you found and what do you <laughs> hope to find at the yeah. South pole that we've never seen before? Well, you know, th- there's, there's really two th- science questions for the South pole as I see it that we want to address. One is the the geology. You know, for me, that's that's kind of the, the part that I'm most excited about. There's the south pole of the moon is on the rim of the largest impact crater in the Earth Moon system. Whoa. It's the oldest crater in the Earth Moon system that we can recognize. Oh, that's cool. So sort of overprinted on everything in the South Pole is the idea that you have this ancient, gigantic impact crater that sets the stage for the rest of lunar history because that's the oldest feature. Everything that we see on the moon, all the Apollo landing sites, all of the places where robotic missions have landed are on top of the the changes to the moon that happened as a result of of this gigantic impact crater. So understanding what's going on with with that feature, the South Pole Lincoln Basin is an open question and uh, provides us with a lot of of fodder for, for, for questions that we wanna answer with Artemis, with other robotic missions. But then you have this unique environment of the South Pole where you have these deep craters that receive very little or no sunlight. We have the potential hints of volatiles, of water, of ice, of other volatiles that are, are, are you know, maybe have carbon or other organic molecules in them. And so we are presented with this really different environment. And in just the same way we think of environments on the earth, whether you have a dry desert or an arid, uh, you know, uh, icy desert like Antarctica or 
uh, wetlands or you know any of the numbers of unique areas on the on the earth that make our planet so special we have these little environments on the moon that make that area special the poles of the moon special and so whether it's shangren 3 landing in what i would call like a quasi polar area not quite at the pole but not quite equatorial or what we want to do with artemis by going to the south pole we'll start understanding these really unusual environments that receive in some places very little or no sunlight or areas that have extended illumination get sunlight more than the 14 and a half days that the apollo sites did and so it's really about understanding these unique environments that we um that we want to go to and that's where the the data from lro have, have held the most because we've had no access we had you know effectively no data for the south pole until until lro got there yeah i i, I wish i could place you back in 1972 which is <laughs> quite a stretch would put you in, a, in an eva suit and have you standing next to harrison schmidt on apollo 14 when they or excuse me apollo 17 when they spotted the orange glass and you could tap him on the shoulder and say if you think that's cool there's water <laughs> ice down that way yeah. that's really going to blow your mind well, wow. And actually, you know, so I've been very, and this is a hashtag humble brag, right? I've been very fortunate <laughs> to get to work with Jack a little bit on looking back at Apollo 17 using the data that we have uh, from LRO and help, oh, cool. you know, help guide, not guide him. Nobody guides Jack, he guides himself, but <laughs> walk through working with the new data to reinterpret those sites. And the one thing about that orange glass that helped actually lead to this new era of lunar exploration was an analysis that was published in 2008 looking at those orange uh, glass fragments from Apollo 17 and the green glass that was sampled at Apollo 15, and that found water inside the glass. Huh. So it's not water that came from terrestrial contamination or water that came from uh, solar wind or anything else like that. It's water that was inside the moon after lunar formation. And that discovery was at the very beginning stages of our re-realization that the moon was not as dry as we thought it was. There was always the, the supposition that the moon is bone dry. And actually they're right because bone actually has water in it. So yes, the moon is bone <laughs> dry. There is water inside the moon, on the moon. And so his samples from Apollo 17 and the discovery of orange glass, I think was part of what put us on the path to this renaissance and lunar exploration because the idea that there's water on, in and at the moon is part of why there is this interest in getting back to the lunar surface and getting back to the lunar poles. So that's a perfect segue to my next question, which is, uh, could you tell us about how, I know that one of the goals of LRO was to try and, and see if you could spot water on the moon. Mm -hmm. And you had an instrument for that, didn't quite get the results you were hoping for, if I understand correctly, but then that shifted with LCROSS. Can you, can you just talk about that process yeah. and that moment a little so bit? Yeah, well, so let's go back, you know, LRO, right, was, the instruments were selected on LRO in 2005 or so. And it's, boy, I mean, I could go to Jim Garvin and thank him for putting this instrument suite together because the idea was that all of the instruments could individually do a lot, but when you stack the data together and bring it together, you can tell a, a more robust story. So we actually had multiple instruments on LRO that could help us understand the lunar water story, lunar volatile story. And, you know, we've used all of the instruments together to try to constrain what's going on. And in addition to a U.S. instrument that was on the very first Indian lunar spacecraft, Chandrayaan-1, the Moon Mineralogy Mapper. And so it was at that time a com combination of instruments that helped get us to where we are today in telling the lunar water story. Now, when we went to the moon, we thought that we would only find water inside those very dark, very cold, permanently shadowed craters at the South Pole, and it turns out that multiple data sets have suggested that water is present at the lunar surface almost everywhere, that it's it's widespread, that there's a, a you know, a, a very thin layer of veneer of, of water, water molecules across the lunar surface, and it's in only some places near the poles where we find enhancements or, or maybe more abundant water or, or OH. And indeed, that, that, that L-Cross experiment, which targeted an area in the South Pole, Cabeus Crater, that has the highest, or at least what we think is the highest abundance of water that kind of gave us our first ground truth measurement of that. They went and touched the moon, blew up a piece of the moon by crashing a spacecraft into it, and we saw what was blown off of the lunar surface and up and measured what was there. 
And that set the stage for us understanding, well, we think we know how much water might be present. Um, and, and unfortunately, it's now been, you know, like you said, 14 years since that experiment, since Elcross. And now with these missions heading to the South Pole, we'll, we'll actually begin to dig in and touch with rovers these, these volatiles and understand exactly what's, what's there. Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. Keep your team's IT skills current. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners will receive at least 20% off or as much as 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution Plan. The discount's based on the size of your team when you fill out their form. 